Good evening and welcome to the uh, inaugural lecture of the Mary Jo Reagan uh, Lecture on Interdisciplinary Studies. Uh, we have with us uh, guest Dr. James Welch. Um, and, and just a little background, um, this is what we do here. It's, it's actually in our mission statement, uh, the university mission statement. Um, and we've had this history for I believe 50 years now of interdisciplinary studies. I think we probably had this going on before the term itself was even used. Um, possibly. Uh, and integrative studies has spawned a lot, of, um, a lot of new words, interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, multi-perspectivism, uh, trans-interdisciplinarity, um, probably even pseudo-interdisciplinarity, <laughs> quasi-interdisciplinarity, and in time I'm sure we'll experience some neo-interdisciplinarity. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Dr. Welsh spent the, the day with us and visited some of our classes and we've had a lot of time for our faculty to visit with him. It's, it's been a pleasurable experience for us. Um, so Dr. Welch uh, holds a PhD in Humanities, the History of Ideas from the University of Texas at Dallas. He's published articles and book chapters on interdisciplinary theory, practice, and integrative learning along with works that apply an interdisciplinary approach to sustainability, social work, civic discourse, and gun control. Dr. Welch is the Vice President for the, Devel uh, de for the uh, Development of the Association for Interdisciplinary Studies. This is a uh, national organization uh, for interdisciplinary studies, and USAO is a, an institutional member. Um, he's the chief uh, editor of their quarterly newsletter, so a lot of what they disseminate goes through him, uh, and that publication is called Integrative Pathways. He's been a faculty member in the Interdisciplinary Studies program at the University of Texas Arlington for over a decade, and he served as interim director of the program from 2011 to 2012. Um, and he's here to take interdisciplinarity any way he would like to go. Um, and I tell you what, I have heard more multisyllabic words today than I've heard in a long time. <laughs> Dr. Welch, please. Unfortunately, uh, multisyllabism is a, a just stock and trade of this particular field. Um, what is interdisciplinarity is not an easy question to answer. And I will tell you why. When you are in the job of comparing multiple perspectives together, you are in the world of pluralism. You are in the, you are in the world of flexibility and adaptability. And that means that there is a kind of chameleon aspect to interdisciplinary studies the way that it is applied depending on upon its context there is in fact a basic inherent incoherence to the whole concept because it depends you know um, the way you do interdisciplinarity when you're trying to build a mars rover is going to be a little bit different from whether you're trying to formulate some kind of new transportation plan for a city or a sustainability initiative, or solve uh, uh, climate change, or any number of complex issues. And so what we try to do in whatever you would call the field of interdisciplinary studies are find some underlying theoretical principles and practices that can sort of help us go through any number of these operations. And so for any of you who are involved with uh, students who are members of interdisciplinary programs, you know as well as I do, they have incredibly divergent interests and goals that go far beyond what they're going to do inside of the university towards their professional goals and after graduation or into graduate school. And they're all sitting in one room with you, teaching them. And so trying to find uh, a set of of ideas that's going to connect with each and every one of those is, is very problematic to say the least. Administrators love the term interdisciplinary studies because it means that they can start lumping together departments from all over a campus in order to cut budgets and cut tenure lines and that sort of thing. Uh, not that anyone here would do such a thing. Uh, I've seen it happen though. Um, uh, for, uh, for others, it is a direct threat to the disciplinary structure of the university uh, and therefore is a placeholder for nonsense and absurdity. 
Uh, for others, on the other side of the spectrum, interdisciplinary studies is an opportunity to disrupt the structure of the university, to attack disciplines, and to open up new ways of, of uh, organizing knowledge uh, or disrupting knowledge. And so this intrinsic pluralism is a, both a blessing and a curse. Okay, we need a little bit of ambiguity in order to, to be able to create innovative solutions to new complex problems. But you don't want so much incoherence that you can't convince your colleagues and your administrators and your students that there, this is a thing. And so uh, I'm going to go with my mentor, uh, Alan Repko's definition, or at least a version of it. Interdisciplinary studies is, takes insights from multiple perspectives and integrates them in order to solve complex real-world problems. Now, write that down if you wish. Uh, but that covers a lot of territory. And of course, like the term interdisciplinarity, it is a compound of a lot of different definitions, all of which could be translatable. But regardless of the context that you're working in, I believe, personally, that interdisciplinary studies is an incredibly powerful way of approaching knowledge uh, for the 21st century. And I'm going to explain how I do it and how I think of it and how I think that it can work in a lot of different contexts. I think that it is treating the world the way it is in its native complexity through the structure of the disciplines and through this, this incredible uh, pull for specialization that, that we've had for centuries, honestly, as a, as a society. Uh, we tend to pick things apart and separate them. The world isn't like that. The world is this in interconnected dynamic mass. And that's where we're at. And if we don't find an approach to knowledge that treats reality the way reality is, then we are simply imposing our will, imposing an order upon it. And that has been a failure of, of disciplinary knowledge. And interdisciplinary studies arose in order to try to counteract that failure. So I'm going to attempt to hit on an overview of interdisciplinary studies, drawing upon my experience as an instructor in the field, as a researcher. And I research interdisciplinary studies as a thing itself. <laughs> okay? That's what I do. I'm trying to develop a, a theoretical basis for interdisciplinarity as a thing itself. All right? not as a means to an end. So uh, along the way, I have used it to explore things like sustainability and complex issues, but the, the core is understanding what it is about it. And I came upon interdisciplinary studies very early on in my academic career, uh, in the 80s, when it was just being thrown around by a handful of really uh, strange alternative uh, institutions. Uh, and I found there my home. Now, it's a very shaky home, let me tell you. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it's, it's a place that I feel like I've, I've been able to thrive and, and pursue something uh, very interesting. Um, I want to differentiate a little bit uh, some of the terms that, that he was throwing around. Uh, again, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, different things, different people. Take it with a grain of salt. But in general, uh, a multidisciplinary uh, program or operation would mean that you have different disciplinary perspectives that are simply juxtaposed with each other and not really synthesized into any kind of coherent form. A transdisciplinary program would be almost the opposite of that, where you are dissolving interdisciplinary boundaries in order to uh, create uh, what I like to call kind of a grand unified th field theory of knowledge. Uh, pipe dream? Yes. Yes, that is. Uh, now, my European colleagues say that there's, there's new uh, definitions of transdisciplinarity that are, that are going around in Europe right now. So that's, that's definitions. Now, I'm going to try to hit on some things along the way that I think are important and uh, why uh, this is a fascinating field, regardless of what your, your particular disposition is. Um, I believe that interdisciplinary studies constitutes a powerful problem-solving system for the unique problems of the 21st century. And so let's start with our students. Supposedly that's what the university rests upon. Uh, and there 
our students, I think, are in a very unique place right now. And they are inundated by complexity, okay, in a way, or at least in ways that maybe we weren't. Uh, for one thing, kids these days, surrounded by electronic information overload, okay, and the um, concurrent attention span collapse that that entails. Now, let's not fool ourselves into thinking that this is the only generation that's had attention span problems, all right? We forget what it was like when we were young, but it, what they do have uh, it are a lot more things encroaching upon their time uh, than, than we had, okay? Little gadgets that are beeping and going off, instant information at their fingertips, and what happens is that you're suddenly now living in a cloud of information that is incredibly dense and difficult and chaotic and overwhelming and bewildering. And how do you go about sorting through it to figure out what's right and wrong and what's real and not real and what's going to be useful and not useful? Okay, YouTube, wonderful thing. But, you know, cat videos. All right, and so what our students need are tools to deal with this level of complexity, tools that specialization does not help them address. And so this is where interdisciplinary studies comes in. Uh, also, another thing that is disrupting uh, this world is that the entire notion of expertise is breaking down. Uh, with uh, the web 2.0 and social media, you don't need a film uh, critic to tell you what movie to watch. You don't need a food critic to tell you which restaurant is good. You don't need a doctor to tell you what's wrong with your foot, all right? Or how to raise your children, or how to deal with any number of things going on. Instead, it's this, instead of a hierarchy of knowledge, it's now this diffused field of knowledge. And it's much more confusing to go through that when there are no steps up a ladder that says this person is more of an authority than this person who's more of an authority than this person. So the whole notion of educational authority has become tampered with. Now, this can be a good thing, but it does make problem solving more problematic. Another serious problem we have uh, is the incredible panoply of ideologies and belief systems that are available uh, to people. Now, you have two choices floating around in this big sea of information. One choice is to float. The other choice is to retreat. Now, we have to realize that, that open-mindedness and all of this, uh, this soup of information that we're floating around in is incredibly unsettling and disconcerting to people, a lot of people, us sometimes. And if you don't have the tools to cope with it, then you're lost and frightened. And so what we see, you know, and I assume you get this in Oklahoma just like we get this in Texas, is a retreat into ideological paradigm bubbles. Where you form a belief system, you crawl up inside of it, you stay there in your echo chamber with other people who believe the same thing you do, and you scream at anyone who doesn't agree with you. Okay? I've seen entire town hall meetings that work this way. Okay? It's frightening. Uh, it's also a complete breakdown of the democratic system, you know, but we'll get to that in a little bit. And so, instead of embracing open-mindedness, you embrace fragmentation. And so that's a problem that we have to deal with. All of this comes as a reaction to what I like to call epistemological vertigo. Not knowing where to stand. Not knowing what, how to base a decision. Not knowing what is going to be for the best. Not even knowing what best practices even means. And so what we have to teach students, and ourselves as well, is how to navigate through this ocean and get where we want to go, even define where we want to go can sometimes be a problem. And so interdisciplinary studies is about establishing these kind of techniques, for me at least. Now, this aversion to unpredictability, to being unsettled, has an incredible uh, long history. Our entire philosophical tradition is based upon 
trying to get rid of uncertainty. From the very beginnings, we based our view of knowledge on absolute truth. Okay, Plato was very clear about this. You cannot base truth on anything that changes. Well, that eliminates the entire material world. Okay, so where is truth then for Plato? And oddly enough, it's shaped like a triangle. Now, they believed uh, that these eternal ideals that are abstract constructions of our minds were um, more real than the world. So there's trees everywhere. Uh, they're all different. And they live and they grow and they die. The idea of treeness stays the same forever. And so they based an entire philosophical system on this. Later in medieval times, this gets inculcated with the idea of God as a transcendent, immutable, eternal truth. And so we have built into our very cultural traditions an aversion to relativism and instability and all the things that now are characteristic of the reality around us. Okay, it worked for a while when we were culturally isolated and we could close ourselves into enclaves where everyone agreed with each other. I grew up in Tyler, Texas. I know how this works, uh, but now there's information, there's electronics, there's globalization, the system is breaking down, and it never really uh, worked in the first place, honestly. And so, this continues through the Western tradition, through Descartes and Kant and, and all the way up until you start getting into empiricism and, and Hume, and then you get into uh, postmodernism and poststructuralism. And so what postmodernism identifies for us is the fact that one of the essential functions of human beings is paradigm building. That what we do is we build a belief system that more or less you know, has something to do with reality. Uh, and once we've built it, we crawl up inside there and live. And then suddenly everything that we look at is filtered and distorted through this belief system. Okay? And once you get populations that start to clash together, then these belief systems start to break down. You know, and according to Kuhn, uh, if you get more evidence, then they can also break down, that sort of thing. But what postmodernism gives us is this metacognitive realization that we do this. And that gives you an opening to start to make the paradigms that you're projecting intersect with others, open to new ideas, so that you're not stuck in a belief system. Human beings have an incredible capacity to become fixated upon a single way of looking at the world. This is part of our psychology. It gives us psychological uh, stability. By becoming aware that we do that thing, then we destabilize ourselves. And that leaves us an opening to discover things that were normally obscured by the belief systems that we had, had held. So interdisciplinary studies comes up out of this disruption, specifically the disruption that comes from disciplinary traditions. And this open-mindedness, the ability to compare different worldviews together is what makes interdisciplinary studies happen in the first place. But that's not the whole picture. Another philosophical tradition known as pragmatism helps interdisciplinary studies as well. Pragmatism comes out of the empirical tradition. Pragmatism is about getting things accomplished. It grounds our ability to uh, understand the world. It grounds it in solving problems. And so these two different facets of interdisciplinary studies work together. They're called the different modes of, of interdisciplinarity. The instrumental mode is the practical problem solving aspect of interdisciplinarity. The critical mode comes directly out of critical theory. It's the part that disrupts patterns of understanding, creates openings, and lets, lets new information come in. You pair these things together and you get this kind of dynamic equilibrium where you have two different facets of, of a problem solving technique that are conjoined into one system. Okay? And this sort of characterizes the interdisciplinary approach. It's not trying to create too much order. It's not trying to create too much chaos. It is trying to step in and use the strengths of both of those ways of looking. And so along with this, 
interdisciplinary studies embraces multiple ways, alternative ways of knowing, including creative ways of knowing, um, um, intuitive ways of knowing, and spiritual ways of knowing. That what you're trying to do in interdisciplinary studies is hit it with all cylinders. Make all facets, cognitive, emotional, intellectual, work together in order to solve problems. Now, what comes out of this is the process of integration. Interdisciplinary synthesis, synthesis and, in, and integration are, are basically interchangeable in this world. Regardless of what you think about interdisciplinary studies, if you are trying to work on a complex, multifaceted problem using multi-dimensions, multi using multiple points of view, you are engaging in some form of synthesis, whether you're conscious of it or not. What we say in interdisciplinary studies, though, is by becoming conscious of it, becoming metacognitively aware of this, you can cultivate and hone these skills, and you can get more insight out of it. And so one of the things that you have to realize when you're trying to look at integration and synthesis is that it is not something you have to make up from scratch. It is a natural and a neurological tendency of human consciousness. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of brain physiology here um, other than to say this. We have no idea how the brain creates consciousness. Okay? No idea. But I can say this that your mind is an integrative organ from the moment you're, no, I'm sorry, before you were born, your mind is an integrative organ. What we are doing all the time throughout our entire lives, 24 seven, is taking all the information from our five senses, from our experiences, from our memories, and constantly creating new holistic neural maps out of it. All the time, consciously, subconsciously, unconsciously, we do this. This is the primary function of our minds, is to do this. And so, there is a reason that integration, synthesis, creativity are at the top of Bloom's taxonomy. Okay, because these are the things that make us uniquely human. And so, in interdisciplinary studies, when we emphasize integration, we're taking advantage of a natural aspect of the human mind. And so if integration is natural, then the disciplines in some ways are fundamentally artificial because they are dividing what was first integrated together. Now, that doesn't mean they're completely arbitrary. Uh, there, is, there are fundamental difference, differences between plants and rocks, okay? And probably they deserve different specialists looking at them. But, you know, history and poetry, Mm, a little different, yeah. Economics and political science, yeah. maybe not as different as they should be. So there are, what we have to realize is that disciplines are convenient. They are convenient organizational tools. And uh, regardless of what the anti-disciplinarians say, in interdisciplinary studies, we are not trying to dissolve the disciplines. You guys are doing great work. Uh, you have very conveniently indexed uh, journals for us to read, and <laughs> you know, honestly, I'm not going to sit in, in an astronomical observatory for eight hours a night, but I would be glad to read your paper about what you did. Uh, and so, integration is another thing. And you know, is it parasitical a little bit? Yeah, sure it is. Uh, but that's okay, because we're building bridges between things. You know, that's, our job is to build bridges between what disciplinarians do. And that is, that is a full-time job, folks. It really is. So we don't want to do away with the disciplines. We just need to understand a couple of things about them. One, Foucault is right about the disciplines. They are knowledge power structures that are projected. And that, that there are social economic interests that, help, that disciplines help keep in place. And you need to know this because then you realize that, that the constructive at aspect of them means that they can be tweaked, messed with a little bit. It's all right, you don't have to destroy them to mess with them, right? Uh, the, another thing is, for better or worse, these disciplinary silos are cracking. They just, they are. It's been going on for a while, it's happening now, and might as well embrace it. Now, maybe cracking is not the proper metaphor, maybe they're just becoming more semi-permeable, and, and that's a good thing. All right, so, <laughs> Learning, not a filing cabinet. 
Okay, our minds don't take little disparate nuggets and facts and file them away in some sort of alphanumeric matrix. That is not how our minds work at all. Instead, the, the metaphor I like to use is that we're growing a little crystal. And that as you get new knowledge and new experiences, it, the crystal starts to grow and all the facets sort of reflect each other in this holographic way. And eventually it ends up looking like Superman's spaceship from the first movie. <laughs> But that's just me and, and, and my mind. Uh, but it is a neural, a multi-dimensional neural network that we're building. And the neuroplasticity of our brains, that's what it's adapted to do. We don't have little discrete sections where we keep little memories. Instead, we have webs of associations. And that's how we learn, is by creating associations. And so the process of integration is mimicking what's already part of the learning process of the human mind. And again, by adding a layer of metacognition on that, you're able to take hold of that process, make it your own, and hone and cultivate it so that you can become better at it. All right, now, aside from all these theoretical concerns and neurological concerns, um, there are practical skills that we try to teach in interdisciplinary studies. And there's dozens of them, and so I'm just gonna hit on a few that I think are important. Uh, and, and, and some that I think will be important to you in, in this particular institution. Appreciation for diversity is at the top of my list. And so anytime you're dealing with uh, multiple perspectives, it's not just disciplinary perspectives we're talking about anymore. We're talking about cultural perspectives. We're talking about gender perspectives. We're talking about ideas that are diverse. Not just multiculturalism, diversity of ideas. And that is the founding um, fertilizer of democracy, is this plurality of ideals. And so this requires a little disruption of comfort zone. Okay, I grew up in a fairly small Texas town, a very segregated small Texas town, you know, and you go to church with other people that believe the same thing you do, and you're surrounded by people that believe the same thing that you do, and when you're con confronted by difference, it's unsettling. And so we have to teach what I like to call, or what, what we call toleration of, tolerating um, ambiguity. Okay, now this flies in, in, in the face of the entire Western tradition till you get up to Foucault and Derrida, right? Uh, why would we not want to be clear? Okay, that's my job was here, I was supposed to de define this for you, and I'm telling you, no, no, <laughs> no, you don't want to do that, really. Um, why? Uh, because you're expanding the comfort zone, all right? Uh, there is um, nausea that comes from open-mindedness. You know, this vertigo that happens, this unsettled, I don't know what to believe or think, and I'm really kind of scared and confused. And so when I tell my students, all right, it's like, it's like getting your sea legs. I, I'm not, you know, I don't go out on ships or anything, but I know this as a metaphor. Okay, so if you're on a boat, and you're standing very strict and straight, and you're trying to walk a straight line, what is going to happen to you? As soon as the boat rocks, you are going all through the side. So instead, you want to kind of get down in your bear stance. All right, you're going to lose a little bit, kind of weave a little bit, and know that as reality is shifting around you, you have equilibrium, dynamic equilibrium. And that's stability and coherence in the face of dynamic changing world that we actually live in. And so uh, use the metaphor as, as, as whatever you like. Uh, another example I use, okay, so <clears throat> riding a bicycle. If the, bi if the front wheel was welded to where you couldn't steer, what happens to that bicycle? It falls right over. Because what you don't realize is that even when you're dry riding straight, you're making these minute little adjustments constantly, not just with your hands and the steering wheel, with your whole body. And that's how we actually get through. That's how we keep balance. And so you're not trying to find clarity and stability and certainty, you're trying to find equilibrium in the midst of this. And that gives you the capacity to deal with the shifting sands that characterize reality. All right. Another thing that we forget about is critical thinking skills uh, because they seem so straightforward. 
But you know what? You need a sense of judgment. You're in a sea of information and you need to know what's BS and what's not. You gotta separate the wheat from the chaff. Otherwise you think like, for instance, the tea party is a good idea. <laughs> I did that. All right, speaking of tea party, negotiating conflict is a big deal for interdisciplinary studies. Now conflict, if you're dealing with multiple perspectives, is inevitable, period. Not just the conflict that comes from different ways of looking at it from disciplinary expertise, but different ide ideologies and political philosophies that clash, different belief systems, different special interests that clash. Things clash. Get more than one person in a room, and sometimes all you need is one. Things are going to clash. <laughs> okay. And it's not enough to go around the table and have everybody say their piece like they do on all those talk shows and just say, well, that's all the time we have for now. <laughs> all right. What gets accomplished? Nothing but a screaming match. Okay. And unfortunately, this kind of demagoguery, this kind of punditry is now the model for conflict resolution. It's not in resolution at all. It's just conflict. And so we've got to know where the line is with conflict. Uh, there's productive conflict and there's unproductive conflict. How do you know when unproductive conflict is happening? Because one, nothing's getting done. Two, you're really hurt. And, or you've really hurt somebody else. Because you've decided that your ideas, uncompromised, are more important than anybody else's. Okay, unfortunately this is characterizing Congress right now. Uh, and uh, city council meetings all over, everywhere. Okay, we have lost the art of conflict. Okay, and so common ground has to be the next step. Conflict happens when ideas are brought out to the open and start clashing with each other. If they turn into headbutting, then nothing is going to get accomplished. But when you start to achieve common ground, nobody gets their ideas to happen. But everybody gets some aspect of their needs met. And everybody is able to suddenly see that there are goals beyond me for the good of the community or the group or the organization or the institution that aren't exactly what I would have done if I was the dictator in charge. But that's what a democracy is about. And so we have to teach our students how to do this negotiation. You know, and in interdisciplinary studies, this is what we do, period. Okay, we think we're going to get an economist and, and a biologist together and they're just going to get on the same page. We don't even want them on the same page. Okay, we want them to contribute facets to the bigger operation that we're trying to do. And we negotiate something greater than what they would have done on their own. Or what they would have done if they'd gotten their own way. So, part of this is communication. Now, every field of knowledge speaks a foreign language to each other. We all know this. Economists, oh my God. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, and then see, and it's like economists and sociologists will be talking about the same thing. And they're using entirely different words for it. Uh, and this is just one example. Um, you know, we also, uh, this, this counts for belief systems as well as uh, you know, ideologies, uh, keywords that you see used in, in uh, political uh, propaganda, all these things create language systems. Somebody's got to translate these things. For me, the big, the big example is a, um, uh, what's called an ARD meeting in special education. That is where you've got a kid and uh, um, he's surrounded by specialists. You've got your speech pathologist, you've got occupational therapy, physical therapy, you've got all their subjects. Every single one of those specialists is looking at one little slice of that kid and they're all speaking different languages based upon their training. Somebody's got to sit there and coordinate that because it's still one kid. It's not a bunch of little kids broken into pieces. And so that's what we have to do in interdisciplinary studies. And that's how we, we solve problems and get things done. So all of these things are ways of navigating complexity, <clears throat> which is not fun sometimes. So why interdisciplinarity? Well, for one thing, it really hits upon good old-fashioned traditional liberal arts values. 
uh, especially the values, you know, we talked about citizenship and, and, you know, democratic problem solving, but, you know, let's not forget the value of a well-rounded education. Okay, I, I have to tell my students all the time, why do you think we make you take a science lab or a literature class or a writing class? Why do you have to take art appreciation if you're going into business? The university isn't just about helping you make money or helping you meet your individual goals. It's about helping build a better society that you need to be equipped to deal with. You know, and so put your, you and your selfish little parochial concerns aside for a, se a second and, and help make a better country for my daughter to grow up in. Okay, can you do that? That'd be nice. Uh, and so for their own purposes though, this well-rounded education is really fundamentally helping prepare them for the shifting sands of the real world. Because job markets are gonna come and go uh, technical, technological innovation is going to keep disrupting everything we thought was real. And if you don't have a, not even a skill set, a disposition that allows you to adapt to new and changing circumstances, you're screwed. And so don't do it for us, do it for yourself. Okay, so I have to write on the board, no bad knowledge and go love your math class. Go hug your math teacher, <laughs> dare you, because you need to know it. Don't care if you don't like it. So uh, another thing that we're doing is we're, we're trying to train the art of paradigm shifting. We're professional paradigm shifters as interdisciplinarians, which means that we're not just asking you what you think about a complex problem. We're trying to see it from your point of view. And along with that uh, is, is sort of the art of epistemological negotiation that we're not just going and looking at things that you've discovered, we're looking at the very way you go about discovering truth itself. You know, how does a biologist see the world? How does a poet see the world? What's truth for a poet? What's truth for an economist? Okay. And that requires this kind of flexibility, an almost, almost a cultivation of disciplinary schizophrenia. And it's a, it's, it could be a little unsettling, but if you got your sea legs, you can do it. All right, out of this comes the art of craft of cooperation and collaboration. Everybody's talking about interdisciplinary teamwork, right? Well, how do you do it? Most people can't get through the first meeting. They're lost from the beginning. And so we teach these skills of communication and adaptation and, and bridging of gaps that help you uh, build these teams to build that Mars rover. Okay? or figure out how to get a city uh, street to work properly, okay? or renovate a community. And one of the things that you have to realize, and it's one of my last points, is that, you know what? Consensus doesn't just happen all by itself. Now, I don't know what your faculty meetings are like, <laughs> but back where I come from, we can make the smallest decision into a earth-shattering controversy. <laughs> and why is that? Because we're all the smartest person in the room. So how could you possibly compromise your idea if you're the smartest person in the room? <laughs> I didn't get where I am today by giving up on my ideas. And so consensus is something that you have to enter into. It is a process that happens. A process that, again, says, my ideas, my needs are secondary to the, the furtherance of the institution are, are the goals that we need to accomplish. Okay? You can train that. Um, a lot of times, uh, for me, it's like, all right, I know this is going to be a hot one. And so I spend a half an hour in my office just getting into a nice mindset <laughs> before I go into the fray. And uh, when I can, I try to be that bridge. I try to be the one in the, in the middle going, yeah, yeah, you've got, some, you've got some good ideas. How about this? You know, I try. Sometimes people consider that insulting. Sometimes they're so happy I'm there to do that. But somebody's got to be that person, okay? Interdisciplinarity helps you train that. So the upshot of all this, I think, and, and, and for me, this is what is really uh, the end result of interdisciplinary inquiry is wisdom, plain and simple. It's a, it's a word we don't like to throw around anymore. I'm sad about that. Uh, wisdom brings all of these faculties together. I even have a little list here. Intellectual, emotional, spiritual, intuitive, critical, logical. There's more than that. 
Okay, there's a whole set of capacities here, not only inside of us, but between us. And wisdom is how you apply them skillfully to the problem in front of you. And so all these paths holistically converge, if not into oneness, at least one-ishness. And um, I think we can come up with uh, ways of solving complex problems. Uh, and I, I think we better. Uh, so that's, that's it. If you have any questions for me, I'd, I'd love to help you.